So Kentuckian Richard Minter Johnson is the one who had murdered, or at least claimed to have murdered Tecumseh during the Battle of the Thames. Um, he becomes the vice president, the ninth vice president, serving under the administration of Martin Van Buren. Um, Martin Van Buren, of course, is, um, you know, from 1837 to 1841, which we all know. That's just clear. Uh, he's the eighth president of the United States, so he was the ninth vice president under the eighth president. And um, he has, before his presidency, he was the eighth vice president and the tenth secretary of state under Andrew Jackson. So he actually looks very similar. He's got a long face. Like Andrew Jackson, uh, Robert Minter Johnson does. Um, he's the one who claims to have killed Tecumseh, so he brags about it for years on end. He also uh, came from Kentucky, so he represented Kentucky in the House of Representatives. He was an ally with Henry Clay. Um, he was a member of the War Hawks that favored war with Britain in 1812. So big fucking surprise there. He he wanted war with Britain. Britain participated in the battle said that he personally killed Tecumseh. Um, as his prominence grew, his interracial relationship with Julia Chen, an octoroon slave, was widely criticized. So he liked he liked black women, right? Julia Chen, an octoroon slave, which what is an octoroon? What the fuck? Quadroon, octoroon. Ancestry of people of mixed race, generally of African and Caucasian ancestry, but also with Australia, those of our Aboriginal and Caucasian. Quadroon, octoroon, what the fuck? So mixed octoroon. Okay, anyways. Um, so Colonel Richard Johnson, Colonel Richard Minter Johnson during a cavalry charge, um, they said that he's the one that killed him. The Americans claimed he killed him. Uh, Tecumseh Richard Minter Johnson is born October 17, 1780, the fifth of Robert and Jemima Suget Johnson's 11 children. At the time, the family was living in the newly founded settlement of Bear Grass near present-day Louisville, Kentucky. So uh, he was basically, he came out of Louisville, Kentucky. Richard Minter Johnson, the person who eventually assassinates fucking Tecumseh, comes out of Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky is part of Virginia until organized admitted into the state in 1792. The women of Bryan Station drew water while the enemy looked on. By 1782, the Johnsons had moved to Bryan Station, future Lexington and Fayette County. So they came from Louisville and then goes to live in fucking Lexington, which a lot of people do. Um, Johnson's mother was considered among the heroic women of the community because of her actions during Simon Gertie's raid on Bryan Station in August 1782. According to tradition, Gertie's forces surround the fort. The occupants discovered they almost had no water inside to withstand the siege. Several Indians had concealed themselves near the spring outside the fork. The Kentuckians re reasoned that the Indians would stay hidden until they attacked. Jemima Johnson approved the plan for the women to go alone and collect water from the spring as usual. Many men disapproved of the plan, fearing the women would be attacked and killed. However, faced with no other option, they finally agreed. Shortly after sunrise, the women went to the spring and returned without incident. Not long after they returned, the attack began. Indian warriors set fire to several houses and stables, but a favorable wind kept the fires from spreading. Children used the water drawn by the women to put out the fires. A flaming arrow landed in baby Richard Johnson's crib, but it was doused by his sister Betsy. So the Indians actually, there's a, Indi a fucking arrow goes into his crib when he was a baby. Um, and I guess it's Brian Station, they said. Yeah, in Brian Station, this all happened in Brian Station at uh, Simon Gertie. The fucking, you know. Uh, the great Simon Gertie, the fucking hero, uh, the revolutionary Simon Gertie. He's the one that's actually attacking uh, baby uh, Richard Minter Johnson's family. Um, he isn't actually attacking, you know, the, <laughs> the baby. Even though there is a, uh, a, a um, an arrow that's landed on there in his, um, you know, baby's bed. So... Children used water drawn by the wind and put out the fires. A flaming arrow landed in Richard Johnson's crib. It was doused out by his sister Betsy. Help arrived from Lexington and Boone Station. The Indians retreated, but the Wyandotte historian Peter D. Clark wrote after talking with Indians who fought in the battle, among the retreating Indians was a Potawatomi brave. So here's another Potawatomi, okay? So who, on perceiving an American officer, supposedly a Colonel Johnson on horse, this is, um, 
Tecumseh. This is about Tecumseh. So, um, close upon him, turned to tomahawk his pursuer, but was shot down by him with his pistol. The fallen Potawatomi brave was probably taken for Tecumseh by some of Harrison's infantry and mutilated soon after the battle. So, they take his body and they mutilate it. So, how do you know if it was Tecumseh or not? The fallen Potawatomi brave. And they, they always, Hugh McGarry, he like fucking takes pieces to, of an Indian and feeds it to his dog and shit. And then um, you had a uh, uh, chief, uh, it wasn't roundhead, it was doublehead, chief doublehead, Cherokee chief, who said white people tasted, they were too salty, <laughs> he said they were too salty, which I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, the fallen uh, Potawatomi brave is probably taken for Tecumseh by some of Harrison's infantry and mutilated soon after the battle, a half Indian and half white named William Caldwell. Whilst retreating after the last encounter, overtook and passed Tecumseh, who was walking along slowly using his rifle for a staff. When asked by Caldwell if he was wounded, he replied in English, I am shot. Caldwell, William Caldwell noticed where a rifle bullet had penetrated his breast through his buckskin hunting coat. His body was found by his friends where he had laid down to die untouched within the vicinity of the battlefield. Several of Harrison's men, army, claimed to have killed Tecumseh. I'd have killed Tecumseh. I have some of his beard, one would say. I'd killed Tecumseh. I had a piece of his skin to make me a razor strop. None of these braggadocios were in the last battles in which the brave chief received his mortal wound. The death of Tecumseh is examined in great depth. Tecumseh's Last Stand by John Sugden, 1985, University of Oklahoma Press. Entire chapter is devoted to the subject. It would behoove anyone interested in the subject to read it. The question is, was it in the best interest of those given testimony to credit Johnson for taking Tecumseh's life? It seems as this claim would have and did greatly enhance his political career. Sugden, despite his exhaustive study, could not come to the conclusion that Johnson truly was the person who killed Tecumseh. Furthermore, he could not find enough evidence to firmly claim that Tecumseh's body was defiled. So we don't even know if Tecumseh's body was even defiled, even though they said it was. Some Indian accounts indicate his body was removed before this could have been taken place. And unfortunately, both whites and Indians did that shit. Another name has been mentioned, William Whitley. Um, though by some accounts, Sugden places him there. He's already killed. Some credit Whitley. Most recent discovery of evidence to this end is found in the 1929 autobiography of Whitley, descendant James a drain senior single-handed it was a fierce battle missed trees and undergrowth of fighting close and long and hard Kentucky rifles were sent in to save the day and they did grandfather was tall he carried himself as straight as an arrow for all his years his long white hair touched his shoulders on his great snow white horse he was easily marked shot through the body he fell the fatal bullet came from behind a fallen tree from there sprang the great chief Tecumseh intent upon taking for himself a scalp so splendid and so clearly that of a great chief of the white men, but grandfather was not dead, fallen, weakening, hand still grasped his gun, the gun he always loaded with two bullets. So this is William William Whitley, which you know, I guess he's got fucking big flowing white hair. That gun was now loaded now, and as a slayer drew near, a dying man with one motion raised himself to a knee and the gun to his shoulder then he borrowed enough time from that last scant instant of life for his hunter's eye to center sights upon the red man's breast and as he fired he fell on the Indian as well each gone where good fighting men go and how the men of the rifles buried his body at dead of night and fed their horses upon his grave that none might know where he lay and how these men in pride brought back to his Kentucky home the high stepping horse he had ridden away to his death, the horse itself blind of an eye by a shot. Rarely has a great man's death been so drenched in lore. Live your life so that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Love your life, perfect your life, beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and in the service of your people. Always give a word or a sign of salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people and grovel to none when you arise in the morning give thanks for the food and for the joy of living if you see no reason for giving thanks the fault lies only in yourself when it comes your time to die be not like those whose lives are filled with the fear of death so that when the time comes they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way sing your death song and die like a hero going home he rallied many tribes to his alliance by his attacks on white people brothers the white people are like poisonous serpents 
This is all Tecumseh's words. When chilled, they are feeble and harmless, but invigorate them with warmth, and they sting their benefactors to death. Immediately following the American surrender, some of the Kentuckians argued with their officers that they would rather die on the field than surrender, fearing that surrender would lead to their eventual death anyways at the hands of the captors. However, the fighting ceased immediately following their surrenders. Uh, at least 300 Americans initially estimated as killed. Over 500 were taken as prisoners. Proctor, unsure of what to do. So many prisoners wanted to make a hasty retreat in case that William Henry Harrison would send more troops to the area once word of Winchester's defeat reached him. The uninjured prisoners were marched north and then across the frozen Detroit River to Fort Molden. But the wounded prisoners, unable to walk, were left behind at Frenchtown. Proctor had to wait um, another day for sleds to arrive to transport the wounded American prisoners, but he feared that more Americans were on the way from the south. However, on the morning of January 23rd, the Native Americans began robbing and pillaging the injured Kentuckians. Any Kentuckian able to walk was marched away toward Fort Molden, while many of the more severely injured were left behind or simply murdered. The buildings that housed the wounded were set on fire. Those that could escape the burning buildings were mar murdered as they tried to flee, and those unable to move died in the fires. I heard the Padawatomi said not to burn the, you know, this going on, so this all just seems like a bunch of fucking horse shit that people just want to, you know, use. Oh my god, they killed us with such brutality. Well, you was invading their fucking town. Like, what the fuck do you expect? I mean, seriously, you think somebody was to march in the mall draw and just wipe out everybody here, and then they're just going to keep it here? You know, they just move everybody out. You don't think nobody's going to come back? They ain't going to come back with police and with entourage and with people, you know, with a posse? A posse comitatus, which is legal in Kentucky. So, that's, um, that's who actually, Willis Russell had to fight a posse. The Klan was fucking getting the posse. The sheriff was, that's how they would get a posse together. Um, but, uh, so, so, okay, we're talking about the, um, we kind of switched gears a little bit there, but it was in the, um, we're talking about the Battle of Frenchtown, which is all what this entire lesson is about. We're talking about all these different Native Americans because they were fighting in the Second Battle of Frenchtown. Tecumseh, it's important to know, um, about Tecumseh because they want to sit there and talk about, um, the different perspectives. So you got William Caldwell. William Caldwell, who says that he saw Tecumseh had been shot, and he just kind of um, just fell over in a ditch and died. And then you have somebody else who writes that his grandfather had this big-ass fucking beard, William Whitley. You know, so you, if you, Richard Johnson might be able to claim that he killed Tecumseh and made a fucking career out of the shit. Um, even if he didn't kill Tecumseh, you know, he's part of the battle where he had died. And so that's that's something, but it wasn't like William Whitley had said that his grandfather, um, I think, oh no no his a a descendant had put his grandson had put William Whitley at the fucking scene and said that William Whitley was the one who killed him. So William Caldwell says that he had shot saw him shot and he laid off to the side so nobody knows who had shot him then and killed him then. And then you got William Whitley who you know could have been the one that had murdered him because. Um, he was going to come to take his scout because he thought that he had shot him down. So, then we're at the second battle of Frenchtown, right? And, um, so they, after they couldn't take the prisoners of war, they said they killed a shit ton of fucking Kentuckians. Uh, the numbers of wounded killed by Native Americans ranged from 30 to 100. The heedless, um, the needless slaughter of the American wounded, which became known as the River Raisin Massacre, so horrified contemporary Americans, it overshadowed the actual battle and word of it spread throughout the country. The massacre became devastated for the state of Kentucky, which supplied many soldiers that fell during the Battle of Frenchtown and subsequent massacre. The rallying cry, remember the River Raisin, prompted many Kentuckians to enlist immediately for service in the war. The Potawatomi are first mentioned in French records, which suggests that in early 17th century, they lived in what is now southwestern Michigan. The Potawatomi were the ones that actually said, don't set fire to the place. The Potawatomis were the ones that had lived there to begin with. They didn't want to set fire to their own fucking, you know, structures. And then when they were ran out, and they brought the posse with them. And they came with the Foxes, and they came with the Delaware, and the, uh, the Chippewa, the Ottawa, the Miami, the Ho-Chunk, um, the Meskwaki, the Fox, the Salk, the Creek, the Shawnee. So they they brought a whole shit ton of people. <laughs> so uh, during the Beaver Wars, the Potawatomi 
fled to the area around the Green Bay to escape attacks by the Iroquois and the neutral nation. They took part in Tecumseh's War, the War of 1812 and the Pierre Oriole War. Their allegiance switched, switched repeatedly between the British and Americans as power relations shifted between the two nations. Led by Chiefs Blackbird and Nusco Tomeg, Mad Sturgeon, Fort Dearborn.